Aloha. Welcome to American Issues, Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Today's topic, today's title is MAGA GOP Defines Control of the House. We just had our midterm elections and the, the predicted red tidal wave didn't occur. And that's for two reasons. One reason is the moderate GOP, um, I think, was burned out on Trump fatigue. Uh, they burned out on the election deniers. So they decided either not to vote or they, they voted uh, for Democratic Party. And the other reason is um, the independents felt the same way. Uh, they felt it was, it was too much for all these election deniers, particularly in the swing states, um, and all the, the Michigas and rhetoric they were throwing out in the primaries and certainly leading up to the midterm election. So you would think that the GOP had learned a lesson, although they probably haven't fully discussed what happened and why the, the red tidal wave didn't occur. But they pretty much know that, again, independence and, and the moderate GOP didn't go their way. So what do they do in response to that? Well, immediately, uh, various members of the House of Representatives, now knowing it's going to be in GOP control, they take to the microphone. Uh, specific, specifically, James Comer from... Uh, Kentucky, uh, he's out there talking about how the, the House is going to vote for impeachment of President Joe Biden. Uh, that's where they're going. And you would wonder why is it that they're taking such extreme measures when they just received the vote not to be so extreme. So that's the topic of the day, and I'm going to introduce our guest. Today, we have our special esteemed guest, Chuck Crumpton, and my co-host, Jay Fidel. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Tim. Morning, Tim. Jay. Hey, uh, Jay, I'd like to read a quote from a uh, representative, Don Bacon, a Republican representative from Nebraska, and uh, get your reaction to this quote. He says, I want to warn our colleagues. There may be activists in our party that want impeachment, but I can tell you that the swing voters and the independent voters don't want that. We want to change leadership by elections, not impeachment. Impeachment is the outlier. Your response to that quote, and is that something that uh, other Republicans should uh, pay attention to? Yes, I I agree. I would state it, um, you know, more stridently. But um, he's right, and it's good advice to the Republicans. But the Republicans are not likely to take it. Um, you know, it's funny. Every time I look, I think it's Marjorie Taylor Greene is running um, the House. She's running the Republican caucus. And, uh, and of course, she's serving at the pleasure of uh, Kevin McCarthy, who is serving likewise at the pleasure of Donald Trump. So, you know, uh, the inmates, the inmates, how do they say this, Chuck? The inmates are running the proverbial asi asylum and, and uh, they are not likely to stop. They don't care what this fellow said. Um, they got their own agenda and they, they have no interest in serving the public or even serving those voters who sent them a message uh, a couple of Wednesdays ago um, on election day. So is it the leadership that let them get away with this or are they just, uh, the leadership is ineffective and can't stop them? Yes, to all of the foregoing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the reality, which is what we should you know, address is, uh, are they gonna, are gonna be, be able to get away with it? Are they gonna do it? You know, I think there's a fair chance that uh, Kevin McCarthy is gonna stay in position or be in position, uh, although it's not certain, but it's likely he'll be in position as a speaker and he'll let him get away with it. And, you know, I mean, I, I know people who have spent some time in Congress, you know, and they say that the public, including us three, um, you know, has this uh, sort of legacy feeling that the people in Congress are smart, they're educated, they understand, they understand their obligation, their trust, their oath to the country. Um, and, you know, they, they walk around understanding that they are an important governmental institution. But in fact, that's not true. In fact, some of them, you know, really can't hold a candle to an elementary school degree. Uh, they have no idea what's going on and they are, um, they are held ransom um, to people who don't have an idea about what's going on. And I think that's, that's what I would say right now with the GOP uh, Republicans who are uh, the inmates, so to speak, running mm -hmm. the asylum. Um, and so I, I think they'll probably do it. They'll actually probably take a vote, maybe even succeed in that vote, 
why do I feel that Chuck is not going to agree with me? Uh, <laughs> and, and they'll start an investigation of Hunter Biden and maybe some uh, impeachments. And it's all completely absurd. It's absurd in the sense that um, don't we have business to conduct here? Uh, don't we have policies aside? Don't we have important legislation that's pending right now that that has uh, come you know, from the Democrats? Uh, don't we have to preserve and protect democracy and the country and the people? Um, but no, they, they're going to do uh, they're going to do their own agenda. It's, I wouldn't even say it's political. It's a, some kind of strange, grumpian, punitive, divisive, um, completely negative, hostile experience. And it has no benefit for anyone. All right. Uh, Chuck, uh, just to take from Jay, I mean, he's right. I mean, these are, is this a Trumpian um, wish list? that they are marching to and damn the voters, uh, damn the independents, damn the moderate GOP voters that uh, didn't give them the red tidal wave. And now we have the House at margin, uh, a, a very thin margin uh, as far as an advantage of representatives. Uh, what, as Jay likes to say, que pasa? What is, why are they not learning the lessons of the vote and they're going down this pathway that only Donald Trump would really be happy with? Well, if you look at the people who are involved, <clears throat> all of them <clears throat> are power-based people, <clears throat> whether it's McCarthy or Gates or Green or Bobert or <clears throat> any of the rest of them. <clears throat> and they care more about getting and wielding power than they do about coordinating effective leadership or governance or decision-making with each other. So you're all still having people like Matt Gates come out within the last day saying McCarthy doesn't have the votes to get his leadership. He's in a position where he's going to have to broker deals for committee assignments, for legislative packages. There may be a Hunter Biden chase just to satisfy people in there, if they can get trade-offs that will give them committee control or legislative act control. But the Republicans are going to be bargaining and dealing with each other. Their factions are not unified. And the way that the leaders of those factions approach them are divisive, not mm -hmm. unifying. That's worked for them. Why would we expect them to give that up, whether it's McCarthy or Gates or any of the others? Well, I question whether or not it has worked for him. I mean, on the last show, I said, if the Republicans want to start winning elections, they're going to have to stop following a personality, that personality being Donald Trump. So if Donald Trump handed them the loss in 2018 midterms, handed them the loss of the 2020 presidential election, handled them the loss of the special election in 2021 in Georgia, and now handed them the most recent midterm loss of 2022, at what point do they kind of knock themselves in the head and going, hey, following this guy is not winning election for us. Um, where they, you know, what's their you know next what, step? Tim, you know what? I think you're, you're making the assumption that Donald Trump does not learn by his mistakes. You make no, he has nothing to do with it. Donald Trump will be Donald Trump. I'm talking about the moderate GOP that's still basically running the show, uh, the mega GOP still in the wings. But even, even the moderate GOPs are still saying, we don't have a platform. We don't have a policy platform. Uh, our platform is Donald Trump. Well, all I'm saying is that things change. And I think that in, in some corner of their minds, these guys are thinking that uh, they can do this now and they can uh, do what, what I call entertainment government, where if you can you know, get, on, get on the headlines and, and, uh, and, and be... First on Sinclair Radio or Salem Radio, there have been articles about those radio stations, how influential mm -hmm. they are. Um, then you know you can you can entertain me people, and and they can they can wait they can wait a year or more before they try to make the case that they're serious um, representatives of the people. I guess they feel they don't have to make that case right now. The only thing they got to do right now is have power, as Chuck says, and have entertainment value. Okay. Chuck, do you think without a policy platform that they uh, clearly don't have, will that serve them well in 2023 and 2024? 
why should that change either? It, <laughs> it, didn't right. work, okay. it didn't work well for them in 2020, 2021, or again in 2022. <laughs> they all, the new media word is underperformed. <laughs> so we're not seeing leadership on the Republican side that is in any way unifying, that is any way party over faction, party over individual, we're still seeing the opposite. Well, why, we're would, seeing anything, candid- why would anything change? We're seeing potential candidates other than DeSantis say uh, Chris Christie. I mean, he certainly gets it. He said it a hundred times. You know, if we don't start focusing on the economy and things that are important to the American, you know, uh, kitchen table, uh, we are going to lose again. So there's other candidates like Chris Christie. Um, even Mike Pence knows that uh, you've got to have policies that have, that are important to the American people, uh, whether they're GOP or not. Um, so these other candidates that may come out later, uh, do you think they focus in on the bread and butter issues uh, around the kitchen table, or do they stay on the extreme uh, wingnut side of the party, which is mega GOP? Well, two things. One, they always follow the money. And as long as Trump dominates the donors and the money, as he has, maybe not to the extent that he previously did, but still more than any other one person. You're going to see Rubio and Cruz and the rest of them still performing in pretty much the same manner. That's the pocket that they want to tap. We don't see anyone, as far as I can tell, and I'm open to your insights on this, both of you, we don't see anyone like the old Ev Dirksons or Bob Doles or people like that who had any respect or any sway at all on the other side of the aisle. We don't see people who can deliver. The closest okay. they got, McConnell could marshal all of his 50 troops to vote against something, even if 60, 70 percent of the American people wanted it to happen, whether it's infrastructure support or whatever. Well, let's look at Mitch McConnell, uh, minority leader of the Senate. Um, He's no fan of Donald Trump. We all know that. Um, Yet he has admitted that the GOP does not have a a policy platform. Uh, Does that change? Does that change because, one, he can't stand Donald Trump? Two, he's acknowledging that without a policy platform, the Republicans will continue to lose these elections in so many in so many ways. Um, do we see a change, a more strident change out of Mitch McConnell? I, I think we know the four corners of Mitch McConnell, and he's not capable of leading on policy. He hasn't, and he's not going to, whether he has the power or not. The second part of that is there's still plenty of... Um, MAGA Republicans in the Senate, he's got to keep them under control. And that's his, uh, that's his focus. So I don't think you're going to see a change in Mitch McConnell. Um, hmm. Pray as you might. It's not going to happen. Chuck, do you agree with that? Yeah, why should McConnell change? He has no reason to think that what he's been doing for decades has not worked for him. It's He's pretty much a one-trick pony in terms of, I'm here to keep the Democrats from passing anything that might give them any leverage in elections at all, or any other gain. And he's done that to some extent, relatively effectively, with some help from people like Manchin and Sinema, who broke ranks. (laughs) But Well, we heard uh, this this week, we heard this week, you know, uh, former Speaker uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, uh, explicitly in an interview, say, I am, I'm never Trumper. And his rationale was, it's not that I wasn't proud of the things we did as far as judge selection and some of the policies we did on tax reform. He said, I'm proud of those, those accomplishments. He said, the bottom line is Trump can't win anymore, and he's going to force the GOP party to lose. Uh, he was that explicit. Now, you know, Paul Ryan's not in politics anymore, at least for now. Um, but do other candidates pick up on that? We know that Chris, excuse me, that um, DeSantis won't because 
he just got elected governor. So he's going to have to be pretty silent for at least, I would think, eight months to a year. Otherwise, the voters aren't going to be happy that he's switching out of the governor's seat, trying to get into the presidential seat. So are there other candidates, Chuck, that pick up that, that baton that Paul Ryan has left now on the stage? I, I don't see any. I'm open you see to any. you folks. But well, I'm just you know, anybody Paul out there. Ryan is, is not in the House. He's not there. And, and a lot of the names you mentioned, Tim, they're not there. They're not running it. The people in the House are running it, and the caucus is running it. And, you know, we'll see about Kevin McCarthy, but the likelihood is he will run it. And Marjorie Taylor Greene is running it. All these people are, you know, inmates in the asylum. Uh, where You know, the, the guys on the outside, the go guys who are former, the guys who have had a stroke of conscience now years later, they don't mean much. And by the way, I'm, I'm no fan of Paul Ryan. He's the guy, he's the guy that rammed through the tax quote reform act of January 2017, only only a couple of weeks after Trump got in office, a tax reform act that favored the rich and dumped on the poor. We all know that. Uh, and Ryan Ryan became um, you know Trump's lapdog. And so for him to criticize Trump now, it doesn't mean too much. It's hypocritical, as it is for so many of them. All right. Well, let me get to to my next question on this, uh, Jay, for you. Um, the mega GOP, uh, both in the House and Senate, they seem to be rattling a lot of chains about um, investigations on Hunter Biden and how that connects to Joe Biden. Uh, is there motivation, uh, again, a, a strategy of years of distraction until the election of 2024, as was the um, Benghazi uh Senate committee hearings? Is, is that their strategy of distraction or is they really think there's something to it? Oh, they know to a man and woman, there's nothing to it. Uh, it is merely a distraction. It is that entertainment I was talking about it. It'll make headlines, everything they find about his uh, drug usage and so forth. They're never gonna hit any pay dirt on it. And what, you know, what, it's worse than Benghazi. In Benghazi, at least there was a threat of possibility that Hillary Clinton did some wrong. But, just, you know, there's nothing that uh, Hunter Biden did that's worth spending our taxpayer money on and, and distracting Congress this way and uh, avoiding the need to actually address policy. This is only a political okay, well, sideshow. This is the, the part that just throws me off my chair, and I, I don't understand it. If you know a week ago you just lost a, a major election where you had the greatest of opportunities – and you lost it for these very things, these, these wackadoodle you know, approaches to governance, i.e. impeachments and, and investigations of things that are not even close to oh, being a reality. They, they why, are, the, why is the leadership of the GOP not stepping in and putting a stop to it? That, don't forget, they're also uh, talking about impeaching Merrick Garland. Yes. Uh, that, that has more moment to it in the sense that he's you know, the attorney general. I think it's just a way to a attack Joe Biden, a way to attack Joe Biden's government. Um, they never lose an opportunity. They don't give him credit for anything, but they attack him on these irrelevant points. Is this the, that, the leadership of the GOP that's allowing it, or they're just not managing the store at all? Well, we kind of covered that early on. I know, uh, but I, I'm not getting the answers. <laughs> I know you're fascinated with that question. But why don't we move on to Merrick Garland? I would really okay, like to talk about Merrick Garland. Let's move on to Merrick Garland. Uh, Chuck, Merrick Garland punted. He got brought into special counsel. Why did he do that? I think one of the things that you got to look carefully at with somebody like Merrick Garland and his team is he's a long-term player and he's a strategist. This move has been out there for a long time. Trump dropped the other shoe. And Garland was immediately ready for him, said, fine, I've got a special counsel. And look who he picked, Jack Smith, who's a really experienced, really highly respected war crimes prosecutor with neutral political reputation. The people who know him best say, you know, he doesn't play it for one side or the other. So... If you are going to pick a strategy or a person 
to diffuse it. He's also positioned himself because if the GOP goes after Hunter Biden, and that's their attack on Joe Biden, as opposed to the January 6th plus Mar-a-Lago documents, DOJ investigations on Trump, it either cuts no weight with the voters, or if it weighs at all, it weighs in favor of Biden and against Trump, because his offenses are far more personal, far more serious, far more characteristic of his way of dealing with people and power. Well, with all the appeal processes available to Trump and his attorneys, uh, do you feel that this potential delay will um, run up against those deadlines before the 2024 election? I think two things. One, as we talked about a little earlier with whether the GOP leadership in the House lets some of its people go off after Hunter Biden or off after impeachment on Joe Biden or whatever, if they get trade-offs for that, that enable them to get power in committees or power for legislative action, that will be the, the underpinnings of those moves. But it doesn't get them any stronger position for the 2024 election. So the real question is exactly the one that Jay brought up and you're inferring is, who's going to do the most to connect with what really concerns the American people between now and the 2024 elections. It's not gonna be Hunter Biden. It probably will not be January 6th. We've learned what we have to learn about that or Mar-a-Lago. We've learned probably most of what we have to learn about that. But what's gonna happen between now and November, 2024 that may appeal to independents and to young voters who are the two groups who made the biggest difference in the 2022 election midterms. All righty. Thanks, Chuck. Jay, what are your thoughts about the appointment of a special counsel from Mer from Merrick Garland? Yeah, first, I want to say that whether the American voting system and American democracy works is an open question. The jury's out on that. And I'm watching Carrie Lake very carefully mm -hmm. um, because if she if she prevails on um, you know the absurd arguments that she and uh, Steve uh, uh, Bannon are making, and and Mike Flynn too. Oh God, they're back. You know <laughs> they're back. Yeah, it's like the, the the monsters on television. Um, they're back, and here they are uh, arguing the same points that Trump argued before. It's all a lie in Arizona. Unbelievable. Well, we still have two counties in Arizona, Cochise County, and I don't remember the other one that are, are going to refuse to certify their election results. It's, 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 you know, it, the problem is the system may be broken. And it's not only Arizona, you know, there are other states that, that Trump set up before he left. Um, and where Republican legislatures, uh, you know, um, adopted and governors adopted legislation that was anti-democratic. And that is still in place. And, and the Supreme Court is not likely to fix it. And Congress is less likely to fix it. So we make the assumption for 2024 that there'll be a legitimate, um, you know, true and fair vote. I, I, I'm not making that assumption just yet. I want to okay. see what happens. Um, but going back to uh, Merrick Garland, first of all, uh, I want to be iconoclastic about Jack Smith. You know, we when when these guys have been nominated and brought into, you know, the winner's circle there, uh, the press and the people around them said, in the past, over and over again, they're really good guys, and they have a great, uh, you know, background and credentials, and they'll be fine, you know. And it, it's like uh, 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 Bill Barr. Everybody said, "Oh, he's a great choice. He was a terrible choice." I'm here to tell you, he was corrupt from day one. But all these fellows, including a lot of, you know, Democrats, were saying, "No, he's a good choice. You'll see, it'll work out fine." Bob Mueller, he was a great choice. Mr. Chicken Muller, it didn't work out fine, did it? But everybody said, you can't find anybody better than Bob Mueller. Bad appointment, I'm sorry. You know, and and uh, they knew in the Department of Justice. I mean, we've had a lot of bad appointments. 
Uh, and, and look at the, some of those crazy appointments that uh, Trump was making, actually successfully making at the end of his term. They're still in office, including in the Department of Justice. So um, now looking for uh, Jack, uh, Jack Smith. I love that name. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Uh, he, he was uh, doing uh, war crimes prosecutions. I'm here to tell you that um, Think Tech uh, has a, a regular show called Transitional Justice. And we talk to people in Ukraine all the time, every two weeks, uh, who are familiar with the war crimes and the war crimes prosecution in the same court that Jack Smith has been associated with. And I want to I want to tell you here on American Issues Take One, okay, that so far in nine now ten months of full, you know, global uh, acknowledgement and recognition of all the war crimes that have been taking place and are still taking place. Guess how many war crimes prosecutions? Guess how many indictments have actually been achieved in the Court of Criminal Justice in The Hague? You get one guess. You first, Chuck. A very tiny number. How about zero? I, Kim, I get a guess, I Jay? disagree. Yeah. How about nada? Nada. So I'm saying, well, okay, you know, everybody's tripping on this thing about how he's a war crimes prosecutor. Um, does that, should we jump up and down about that? Uh, he hasn't been successful in the most critical period of war crimes in our lives. How about that? Um, you know, so and I guess it's good that he's not associated with the Washington Beltway, and he's not a you know politician. He's a quote prosecutor, but a so I'm not so sure about Jack Smith. Uh, and uh, you know, I just refer back to some of these other appointments where everybody got so excited about the appointment, and it turned out to be a gold-plated dud. The jury's out on Jack Smith. Sorry, sorry. I know I sound like an iconoclast. Um, okay, then there's, there's uh, Merrick Garland. And really the big question of, of the month anyway is uh, why did Merrick Garland feel at this point it was necessary? From a legal point of view, and Chuck will agree with me, it makes no difference whether Trump put his hat in a ring or not. Uh, Merrick Garland could have, should have, um, you know, uh, set, uh, set a grand jury uh, for an indictment a long time ago. Uh, he didn't need anything more than than the three of us read in the newspaper to make that indictment on both of these cases. You know, they still have a thing called circumstantial evidence. You know, it's still part of American law. What are they waiting for? Well, wait, waiting for Godot to write in from Mexico? What, you know, what is it? He could have had an indictment months ago on both of those cases. What is he waiting for? I submit to you that he's hmm, um, a chicken and uh, he doesn't want to do it. And for reasons that, you know, of his own reluctance or lack of confidence or political concern. He is not moving. He hasn't moved in two years on January 6th. Um, so this is a way to defer it. Arguably, this is a way to get him off the griddle. And, you know, the, the ironic point is that at the end, he's going to have to sign off on it anyway. Um, but it gives him, you know, a layer of protection. It gives him deniability. I'm only signing off because Jack Smith told me to. That sort of thing. It's not my decision. Uh, so, um, so that, you know, I'm very concerned that Merrick Garland is not the right man for the job. Uh, he was also great credentials, but he's not the right man for the job. He's been sitting behind the bench too long. I'm sorry. Um, the other thing, and, and we've discussed this about 10 times, is are, are these indictments going to make a difference? You know, I remember so many mayors in this, in this country have actually been indicted, prosecuted, punished, and go to jail. And then they come back and win elections. Um, Trump has 50 ways to avoid uh, all these indictments and all these prosecutions and delay them until it's right up to the crunch in 2024. I am not, cons I, am, I do not believe that any of that, any of those indictments or potential prosecutions are actually going to stop him. Uh, he's going to be back. He's going to run. He's going to reactivate the base. And I think, um, you know, he'll you know, look at the way he got uh, Kevin McCarthy to spin around 360. Uh, look at the way he got uh, Mitch uh, McConnell to spin around 360. Uh, and Cruz, you know, the great story of Cruz and his non-endorsement in the 2016, um, you know, convention, the Republican convention, how he spun around and began to uh, and he refused to endorse Trump. And Trump attacked him 
Uh, and this is, this is in the frontline movie called uh, Trump and U.S. Democracy. And it's very clear that he's just another one of these guys that spun around. Oh, and uh, Graham, uh, Lindsey Graham, watch him spinning like a dervish. Oh, so right. <laughs> if, if these if these guys, you know, and Trump is thinking about this. We're thinking about it. He's thinking about it. Um, and he, he's going to try to, every single one of them, he, he's going to try to spin them around and corrupt them somehow and threaten them. And, and All right. Make, and make those 11 o'clock calls, you know, uh, have his, his, his uh, acolytes make those calls to threaten them or worse. So what I'm saying is um, I, I don't think that Merrick Garland is going to get home on this. I'm not sure at all that Jack Smith is going to help Merrick Garland get home on this. And go back to my earlier point, uh, Trump has lots of possibilities. He's going to play them out. We do not live in a time uh, where we can be all that optimistic. Okay. Thank you, Jay. You know, um, this last October represents my six years working with Think Tech Hawaii and Certainly a big part of that has been, you know, talking about politics, Trump week, shows like that. And it was six years ago I asked a question I never got an answer to, and i like to answer it again. Jay, what brand of coffee are you drinking, and can I get some? It's really funny that you asked me that question, because last night my wife was watching a movie she'd never seen, and it was uh, Don't Look Up. Oh. And, and that's where that comes from. It's the last scene as the comet is about to destroy the Earth. It's really Leonardo DiCaprio sitting at the table with the families, and it's like Thanksgiving. <laughs> Thanksgiving, right? And, and, and they're talking about what brand of coffee you buy at, at, the, uh, at, the, at the market when the, the whole world has only a few minutes to live. And they discovered the comet. They know about it. Um, but they're, you know, they're completely distracted because they can't stand the reality. And Don't Look, Look Up is a profound movie. I urge everybody to see it. Um, and it's, it's, it's not funny. It's not funny at all. And, and I think we live in a world where we are, um, we abuse ourselves. We, we do not recognize the reality. We do not recognize what would happen if we lost our democracy. And the comet of, of the loss of our democracy is coming closer every day. No, that's a, that is a good point, Jane. I always appreciate when you make it. That is an important point to make. Uh, Chuck, uh, we've run out of time, but uh, Jay said that I'm sure Chuck will agree with me on this. Uh, do you? And number two is, what are your last thoughts? Because we're out of time. <laughs> well, to respond to the first question, there is a first time for everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Good. Good. <laughs> As many judges told Jay and me many times, it's taken under advisement, <laughs> right? But I, I don't think the point is whether indictments or trials or verdicts or judgments take place before the 2024 elections. This is going to be a point-by-point -point strategy war, and whichever party manages to come up with and convey to people some sort of unifying leadership strategy may be the one that appeals to those swing voters, the independents, the young voters, and the others. We'll see. Okay, we'll see. Jay, you get the final word for today's show, and um, let it roll. Okay. Aside from everything we've discussed today, and uh, with respect to that five-year period you described, um, we have been concerned with the possibility of what happens when you lose your democracy. Uh, people don't think about that. You know, they don't think about the comet striking the earth. Um, but, but the reality is, um, um, if you don't have government, um, you don't have public safety anymore. If you don't have an orderly transfer of power, you have chaos. And chaos means chaos in the streets. Okay, I mention that because I have always wondered just how that evolves, how that happens, um, how you see it present itself. And so far in the past, what, 10 days, we've had half a dozen um, uh, mass murders in this country. Uh, if, you, if you charted it out, you would, you would see that the number is inc increasing dramatically. O over the period of the, the past year, 2022, there have been dozens and dozens of mass murders around this country. Violence, like for its own sake, people who are really unhinged 
and feel that they have permission somehow um, to do mass murder and suicide and what have you. Um, and, and it's not just COVID. It's the political environment. It's the political virus. And, and I think um, um, we may be seeing a, a forerunner, a canary in the coal mine, on what will happen if we don't, if we, all of us, including the electorate and the, and the, the right-thinking officials, if we don't take steps and reverse the trends that uh, American issues take one and take two have identified. Well, that's what I like, Think Tech. That's why for the last six years I've been volunteering my time for Think Tech Hawaii, is to encourage anyone and everyone to step up and speak out. And uh, Think Tech is a great opportunity and an avenue to do such things. So I want to thank Jay Fidel and Chuck Crupton this, this morning for their thoughts and opinions about this important topic. Um, I wish to say to everyone, happy, great and happy Thanksgiving. And we will see you shortly. And until then, thank you for tuning in for American Issues, Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. Happy Thanksgiving. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.